Aren't you thankful to God that he's shown himself to you in Jesus Christ so that as you inhale and exhale, coming out of your mouth are not blasphemies? So many people today that you hear it, you hear it publicly. This, there was a time in my life where you, there was a certain decency standard where you wouldn't say certain things out loud in public. You may have said them in your own little cluster of friends or when you were alone, by, but you didn't. And today, just all, you can be in the, in the marketplace, all manner of filth comes out of people's mouths. Creatures made in the image of God who inhale as a token of his common grace to all people. It's a staggering reality. Well, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's the Sunday nearest, January 22nd. It's recognized now for 43 years as a response to a Supreme Court case that essentially made abortion on demand legal. So the title of the message today is hashtag every life matters. I'll explain that to you as we go on. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Looking at verses 4 to 7 but zeroing in on verse 7 really today for our purposes. Find that in your Bibles if you would. If you don't have your Bible we have it printed on the screens for you. Stand with me. As I read this, and you follow along, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist, a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living creature, or really I think a better rendering, a living soul. This is critical. The whole generation is trying to stamp out the first 11 chapters of Genesis as being a myth. But we know better. This is history. So we just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. It must be. If it is not be. If it's not, then we're, we're to be pitied by all people. But it is. The Word of God. Thank you. Be seated. As we think about this verse and implications of it for, for life, I want you just to remember today that human beings are made in the image of God and are a gift of God to each other and to the world. And because of that, because every human being, no matter how vile, no matter how dull, no matter how hard, no matter how rebellious, is made in the imago Dei, the image of God, every life matters. I want you to know that today and just be reminded of that today. And secondly, I, I want you to feel a sense of responsibility to demonstrate in word and deed that life, every life, matters. And then I would hope that coming out of this we would have a new commitment to be actively, vocally, and compassionately pro-life. The Supreme Court decision is known as Roe v. Wade. It struck down every state's prohibitions on abortions throughout the entire gestation period of pregnancy. 42nd anniversary will be the 22nd. But it's interesting, I don't know how much you know about the backstory. 
Norma McCorvey is the Jane Roe in Roe v. Wade. She never wanted an abortion. She was seeking a divorce from her husband. And a young pro-abortion feminist attorney named Sarah Weddington offered to represent Norma as a means of attempting to overturn Texas law that made most abortions illegal. Weddington took the case all the way to the Supreme Court which invalidated every pro-life state law in the nation protecting unborn children. And you know the rest of history. From, since 1973, 57 and a half million babies have been murdered in the womb. What you may not know further though is that McCorvey, who was pro-choice on abortion at the time, is now a pro-life advocate. She's been converted along the way. It's a wonderful story. She's now dedicated to reversing the Supreme Court case that bears her fictitious name, Jane Roe. She explained in a video that her effort to obtain a legal abortion in the 1970s when facing an unplanned pregnancy, she realizes, you know, she never had the abortion, by the way. And has never had an abortion. And she realizes now that her court case was the biggest mistake of her life. And currently, fight, she fights now to stop abortion. Here's her words. Back in 1973, I was a very confused 21-year-old with one child and facing an unplanned pregnancy. At the time, I fought to obtain a legal abortion, but truth be told, I have three daughters and have never had an abortion. I think it's safe to say the entire abortion industry is based on a lie. I am dedicated to spending the rest of my life undoing the law that bears my name. McCorvey says. She concludes with this. You read about me in history books, but now I'm dedicated to spreading the truth about preserving the dignity of all human life from natural conception to natural death. So we've almost gotten accustomed as a society of bad law based on lies. And I want you to see today with me from, from this verse in Genesis three things that I hope will help us be more committed to the fact that every life matters and, and express that to others. First, the creation of man is different from the creation of all other life forms in Genesis. We'll look at that. Second, man's life comes from the breath of God. Third, Man, distinct from all other life forms, is a living soul. So verse 7 simply says, Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature, the ESV says. It's the word nefesh. He becomes a living soul. We'll look at that in a few minutes. First of all, the creation of man is different from the creation of all their life forms. If you go back and read the Genesis account that builds up to chapter 2, God said, it's, it's spoke, it fiat, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the animals come out. Uh, those of the sea, those of the air, those of the land. He spoke, and the animals came into being. Everything he created up to the time of man was spoken into being. We speak of that's called creation by divine fiat. But when he comes to create the penultimate part of his creation, he takes a lump of clay from the earth. He takes a lump of clay from the Hebrew says from the Adam. And he molds it into the form of what you and I, had we been observers, would recognize as a human being. He created man differently. We're not, we're not implying that he was not careful in all his other creations. 
What we are saying is that he was especially careful and engaged in the creation of this one being. People who would argue and have us believe that, that we're all just animals, uh, that a dolphin's as intelligent as we are, well that's probably says more about people who can be compared to a dolphin than it does about the dolphin. Uh, or that we have primates in our past. They're ignoring something very critical. In fact, many of the people who argue against creation and against human beings being distinct in creation know that if they win the day in their arguments, then we can, if we're just mere animals, another manifestation of the animal kingdom, then we can treat one another like animals. We can act like animals. And I submit to you what you see going on today in our culture is the, is the moving toward crescendo of what happens when you ignore the Creator and you reject the idea of creation. One writer that I admire greatly one said that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are the critical battleground where evangelicals must stand and advocate what the text really says and expose what it does not say. Because if, you're, if you've been to college and had anybody at all in the area of history or biology or natural science, any of those things, you will have heard someone cast aspersion and doubt on the reality of the historicity of Genesis 1 through 11. If you can remove Genesis 1 through 11, then there is no God, there is no creator. There is no special aspect of man that's any different from the dog or the cat. There is no sin. Therefore, no need of a savior. Everything falls when we give up creation. This is not a message about creation per se. I'll just say parenthetically, when you read the Genesis account and you do a common, a common word study, a common comparison of the, of the Hebrew word yom, there was evening and there was morning, the first yom. Everywhere you find that word in the Hebrew scriptures, it is speaking of a definite period of time. Yom is day. And the, the best biblical understanding of creation is six 24-hour periods. God created the heavens and the earth and all that in them lie. On the seventh day he rested. But now back to this. The creation of man is different from the creation of all other life forms. That ought to make us stop. Anytime someone suggests that, that man is just a different expression of another animal, we ought to stop and say, wait a minute. He was created differently. The second thing I want you to see is that man's life is from the breath of God. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. All other animals have the capacity to breathe. They were, they were created with the capacity to breathe. But not any of the animal kingdom had their origin, their being enlivened by the Creator breathing into their nostrils the breath of life. And there's a reason for that. Because you see what we're going to see in a, in a moment, that the breathing into the nostrils of our first father, Adam, didn't just give him wind capacity. Didn't just give him the ability to inhale and exhale. It gave him life at a level that the animal kingdom does not know. Now it's been suggested, and I'm inclined to agree with it, that if Jesus is the 
contractor of creation. Isn't it a powerful picture? But the second person of the Trinity takes this lump of clay. He had some dealings with clay when he was on the earth as the Messiah, you may recall. He takes this lump of clay and he fashions it into a likeness of himself. And he breathes. And you cannot read the end of John's Gospel where Jesus comes into the room in his resurrected form and he breathes upon them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so at the dawn of creation, the life that we have comes from God. And we trace this out. He breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living being, a living soul. He took Adam's rib as he put Adam into a deep sleep and he forms the woman. Adam is Ish, the woman is Isha. She's come taken from him. Makes breathes into her and she is a living soul. And then after the fall, we're told in Genesis 5 that Adam knew his wife Eve. And they, she gave birth to a son after their image and their likeness. The image of God passed down through birth. And so it is that today now, in the 21st century, we look back and we may not think of it in terms of origins, but just think a moment. Ladies, if you're conscious when you give birth to a child, dads, if you're nearby and the birth is about to occur, almost everyone with all that's going on is thinking, oh, dear God, let him breathe. Let her breathe. Why? Because the breathing is a sign of life. No breath, no life. And that is the way God made us. He breathes into our beings the breath of life. We owe our life to God. And oh, that we were sensitive enough that every time we inhaled, we could think, as, as Josh was saying, I'm breathing in His grace. This inhale, this, this capacity to draw wind inward and fill my lungs is grace. It's a gift of God. It's a testimony and expression that my life, like every life, matters. We say as long as there's life, there's hope. People go through critical times, sometimes critical injuries, critical surgeries. What you're looking for and what you're monitoring. Does he have a pulse? Is he breathing? Because that's the essence of who we are. But you see, the animal kingdom breathes. You watch your pets. They inhale, they exhale. The, the sea creatures breathe in different ways. Breathing is the essential representation and demonstration of life of all living creatures. But of none of the living creatures except man is it said that the Creator breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So let's look at number three here. Man, distinct from all other life forms, is a living soul. The Creator, represented by the second person of the Trinity, breathes into this lump of clay from the earth. And he's no longer just a lump of clay breathes into his nostrils 
the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now the word there for creature, which I prefer soul, is the Hebrew word nefesh. When it occurs in the Greek Old Testament, it occurs 475 times as, nef as soul. 117 times as life. 29 times as person. 15 times as mind. 15 times as heart. Creature, nine times. And we would have been better served had the text read in the ESV because this is what it says in the Hebrew and other translations. The man became a living soul. The soul is the, the self, the, the essence of who we are. It takes in our, our mind, our heart. It takes in our thoughts, our emotions. We, are, we have substance in our being as we breathe because we are souls. The catechism we teach our children says what did God give Adam and Eve besides bodies? And the answer is he gave them a soul that will never die. Do you have a soul as well as a body? Yes, I have a soul that will never die. How do you know that you have a soul? The Bible tells me so. It is a imperative that that be our position. Our first parent, Adam, was not only brought to life from an inanimate object, all the animals were brought to life in, in the spoken word of the Creator. He was not only given the capacity to inhale and exhale, which is necessary for life, but in that act, he was given an immortal soul. And so it is when we read in the Scriptures that life begins at conception, that it's that conception when those, when those first coming together of entities produces the first cells that within that is a soul an immortal soul a soul that will live there in eternity long after the body is gone our Mormon friends teach mistakenly that it's important to have a lot of children because there are all these souls created in eternity past that are waiting to inhabit a body. And so you've got to make babies so that they can have bodies to come into. I don't know where they get that, but where they got it, they need to put it back. Because it's not, it's not the way it is. It is our being formed, as we read from... Psalm 139, in the womb, fearfully and wonderfully formed in the womb that we become living souls. And so it is that not many weeks into this gestation period, you can, by electronic means, hear a heartbeat. I want to say something to you today that when, when Roe v. Wade was at its height, the, the implications of it at its height, the abortion industry, one and a half million babies per year were aborted. Today I say with you in a somber but maybe celebrative way that those numbers are drastically down into the hundreds of thousands. Now, we can rejoice that the numbers are down we must weep and grieve that, that still in this nation, hundreds of thousands of fellow citizens, lives are taken in the womb. 
We are made, created to be living souls. And a part of that being made as living souls is, is the imago Dei, the image of God coming forth in us as persons, human persons, who have capacity to communicate and fellowship with God and with each other and who express personhood as sort of a precursor, a, a preliminary sketch, if you please, of the second person of the Trinity coming as a babe to Mary as Jesus Christ. You see, if we're not any different from the animals, why didn't God send Jesus as a gorilla? Because we are persons. We are persons. We are human persons. We are not animals. We are human beings with dignity. No matter how undignified a person acts, we are human beings with dignity. We must conduct ourselves with dignity and we must treat others with dignity. No matter how different they are, no matter how frustrated we may get. Because that person too is made in the image of God. Now, every life matters. I, I took that title because there's, in recent days there's been this uh, upheaval and a lot of attention paid to the hashtag Black Lives Matter. I personally think that's way too narrow. But you know it's come up because of uh, tragedies taking place in Ferguson, Missouri and New York City where an African American male has been killed by uh, law enforcement. And so we're supposed to believe from the likes of Al Sharpton and Barack Obama and Eric Holder and Jesse Jackson and those that there's something very significant about promoting the idea that black lives matter. They do matter, by the way. But listen to this quote from Pastor Clenard Childress on his site, blackgenocide.org. You can check it out. The most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. Because what people are not saying is a disproportionate number of babies who are losing their lives in their mother's womb are black babies. Ermie Clardy, Irma Clardy Craven, who was a social worker and a civil rights leader, said several years ago when 17,000 aborted babies were found in a dumpster outside a pathology laboratory in Los Angeles, California. I don't know if you remember that story or not. Some 12 to 15,000 were observed to be black. I want to show you a graph. This is the approximate number of African American deaths since 1973, the year that Roe v. Wade became law. You'll see the reference to AIDS. Violent crimes, pay attention to that, 306,313 African Americans have died as a result of violent crimes. And only a, a tiny, small portion of that would be where African Americans have died at the hands of law enforcement. But look at abortion. 13 million African Americans have died. Anyone who says to you that black lives matter and they are not doing all they can to see that Planned Parenthood is defunded and that Roe v. Wade is overturned is a hypocrite. If black lives matter, and they do, then we should wage our war of concern on the issue of abortion.
are many times more blacks have lost their lives to abortion. Now, we don't need to beat ourselves up about this. If you've not been aware of these things, then simply repent for not being aware and show fruit of repentance by making yourself aware and getting in on the discussion. Perhaps you know someone, or you yourself have had an abortion. That is not the unpardonable sin. God is willing to take you to himself. Repent of that and find mercy and grace and help. And find in the church a place where we'll bear the burden of your brokenness. Take sorrow and turn it into joy, the joy of God's free and sovereign grace. Perhaps you have a family member who's had an abortion. Reach out to them. Don't condemn them. The most powerful tool to use with anyone is the tool of love. Don't judge them. Anyone who would submit to having the life of a child in the womb extinguished in a medical procedure is very, very confused, very uninformed, very misled, very hard perhaps and callous. But we are the ones, because we understand Something of what it means to be made in the image of God. We understand the creation account and embrace the creation account. We're the ones who know that we live and move and have our being. We breathe in and out by God's allowance for his glory. We're the ones who ought to be the most compassionate in this pro-life debate and the pro-life agenda. I think it would be wonderful for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, but that is not the answer to abortion. The answer to abortion is for people who know Jesus Christ and who love Jesus Christ. Show that we love God and we love others. We love one another. And that we show the love of God. The last thing someone who has had an abortion, who, who will be soon, if not already, in the throes of, of a, of a post-traumatic stress and a depression following that act, the last thing they need is our judgment and our hate. They need love. They need concern. That's why we support life uh, pregnancy centers that take young ladies in, love them and care for them. We support that's a good agenda. That's why we support adoption. That's why we support foster care. Those are all pro-life expressions that come by and large from an understanding that our heart beats by God's permission. We inhale and exhale by God's permission. We're to live for his glory. And we are, as was said in the video, we're to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. We're to be the voice they cannot be. But a voice of hope, a voice of love, a voice of grace and mercy, not a voice of vitriol, they're already judging themselves many times. They don't need our help with that. What they're having a hard time doing is loving themselves. And so I want us to celebrate today that if you love God and if you believe his book and believe when you read Genesis 1 through 11 that you're reading history and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you value life, all of life, all through life. That is God's doing in your life and you celebrate that. But you are the weapon. A follower of Jesus Christ committed as a disciple to being a disciple maker. You are the weapon that will end this American Holocaust. One woman at a time in a difficult pregnancy. One doctor at a time. One clinic worker at a time. The technology is here. 
3D ultrasound, 4D ultrasound, snapshots. I mean, they look like portrait photography in the womb. The technology's here. We know that before someone is even convinced they're pregnant, that there's a beating heart, that there's the capacity to feel pain. We know the little person growing in the womb is much farther along than anyone would like to admit when we discover that he or she is there. And so I challenge you today what it means to be pro-life, to love those in difficulty, to work as citizens to change the laws, and though we know that the most powerful change that's going to come is the gospel of Jesus Christ entering the heart and mind of someone involved in the abortion industry. Let's pray together.